My name is Walter Feit, Dr. Walter Feit, and we are continuing our prophecy seminar. And tonight we're going to have a look at the book of Revelation, actually the first bit of the book of Revelation, just to see where it leads us and what it has to tell us about the progression of history, how to read the book, and perhaps something about our own condition and what the Lord would like us to know and to take to heart. Well, it's called the revelation of Jesus Christ, which means it comes from the very highest source. And obviously, God would want us to talk about it, preach about it. And obviously, it is very significant because it says in Revelation 1 verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of the prophecy, and keep the things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. So it astounds me that in some circles they say Revelation is a closed book, or a sealed book, or that it is not meant... I've even heard that the book of Revelation is not for God's people, but for the bad people. Well, if that is the case, and if people, some of them say you shouldn't read the book of Revelation, well, they're going to miss out on a blessing, isn't that right? Because it says there, blessed is he that readeth, and that hear the words of the prophecy, and keep the things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. Can we keep something we don't understand? I don't think so. So obviously God wants us to understand what it has to say. Revelation 1.10 tells us the setting. John, the revelator, he was a captive on the island of Patmos. And he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So he heard the very voice of God. Now, in the first chapter of the book of Revelation, there is what we call an epinodos. It's a type of chiastic structure. And it is a way of referring to Old Testament texts, which is meant to highlight a particular point. So, for example, if we read Revelation 1 verse 5, it talks about the witness referring to the Messiah. And if we read uh, Revelation 1 16, at the bottom there, we read about the sharp sword. Now, both of those, the witness and the sharp sword, are quotes from the Old Testament, Isaiah 55 4 and Isaiah 49 2. And then we read in the next one, Revelation 1, 7, that he's coming with the clouds, another aspect of Jesus Christ. And we read in Revelation 1, 3, 15, that he is the great priest the, of the order of Melchizedek, the great priest. And if we look at those two, we see they come both of them from Daniel, Daniel 7, 13 and Daniel 7, 9, 13 and 22. Then we go to Revelation 1, 7. He was pierced, and those that pierced him were wail. And then we read about the candlesticks a little further on, Revelation 1, 12. And those are quotes from Zechariah. And then in the middle, we have the two quotes about, I am the Alpha and the Omega. So what we have, the first and the last of the series are quotes from Isaiah. The second and the second last are quotes from Daniel. The third and the third last are quotes from Zechariah. And then we have a double quote in the middle. Now that is called an epinodos. And you can see that it leads to a central theme. And the repetition of the central theme is what is highlighted by this way of quoting from the Old Testament. And what is highlighted there, of course, is that Jesus Christ, who is the witness, who is coming with the clouds, who was pierced for us, 
who is the one walking among the candlesticks, who is the great high priest, and who has the sharp sword, which is the word of God. He is the great I am. This is one of the tremendous proofs in the book of Revelation that Jesus is indeed God. So the one who gives the revelation is none other than God himself in Jesus Christ. Now, the book of Revelation is a book of the final events. It is the book of the great restoration. And it's very fitting that it should be the last book in the Bible because it is basically the antithesis of the book of Genesis. For example, we read in Genesis about sin that man lost access to the tree of life. Genesis 3.22 and that as a consequence, death came into the world, Genesis 2.17. And that as a consequence, we have to earn our bread by the sweat of our brow, Genesis 3.19. We lost dominion, Genesis 3.24. We became naked. We lost the righteousness of Christ. And we were driven from God, Genesis 3.23. That is the sad story of the fall. The book of Revelation is the opposite. It is the book of restoration. And so Revelation is about grace. Of course, in Genesis, there's also grace, and there is the promise of redemption, but in its fullness, we read about it in the book of Revelation. So in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, we hear about restoring the tree of life. And 2.11, victory over death whereas Genesis talked about death. And then it talks about the hidden manna, 2.17, which was the manna which was placed inside the Ark of the Covenant and refers, of course, to Jesus Christ, the bread of life, who is the one who will give us eternal life again. And then 2.26, dominion will be restored. And 3 verse 5, the nakedness will be covered with the white raiment, the righteousness of Christ, and there will be no more separation from God. Revelation 3, 12. So the two books on opposite sides of the Bible are just perfectly placed. One talks about the loss of all things, and the other one talks about the restoration of all things. But of course, this restoration is not without a battle. It's not without a war. And the adversary of souls who was very busy over there in Genesis is very, very busy down here in the book of Revelation as well. The Bible tells us right there in the beginning of Revelation of God's message throughout time. And it tells us about seven churches. And these churches are then time applica applicable, in other words, the story concerning those churches is applicable to that time, and it's also future applicable. That's the beauty about the Bible. Every single generation can glean something out of its pages. Revelation 1.11 saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. That's one of those quotes where he says he is God. And what thou seest, write in a book. And send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And the strange thing is, this used to be the old postal route. And the interesting thing is that historically in time, they form a sequence. And in that time, they have a particular application as well. What is even more astounding is that the name of each and every single one of them has a particular meaning, which is also prophetic. So God even saw to it that the city got the right names with the right meaning so that they could convey a message to the future. Revelation 1.12, And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, Jesus is the light of the world. The candlesticks represents God's people that are to 
represent this light and give it to the world. So the candlesticks represent God's church throughout the ages. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto a son of man, Revelation 1.13. So the good news is that in spite of the problems, in spite of the apostasies, in spite of the good things and the bad things and the persecution, Christ has never ever left his message. He is depicted as walking in the midst of the candlesticks as the great high priest, dressed in white with the golden sash, ancient of days, all those attributes of the Godhead. Now if we go to Asia Minor, and we look at this postal route, you can see it there, starting in Ephesus, Smyrna, going up to Pergamum, down to Tiatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, I had the privilege of traveling that very road and visiting all the interesting sites and experiencing something of what maybe Paul experienced. Of course, they're all ruins now. But the lessons are still there. And the interesting thing was we had a Muslim guide who led us around this area. And as we drove from city to city, we had the opportunity to speak with her and to speak with her and to speak with her. And she became a Christian as a consequence. And uh, she even made the cover of the Signs of the Times and a uh, very interesting story. She's uh, now married to a pastor and is translating interesting books like The Great Controversy, for example. <coughs> Revelation 1, 19 to 20. Write the things which thou hast seen. This is very important that we read these texts very carefully. Because there are people who would want to confuse us and say, you know, maybe we're interpreting the book of Revelation incorrectly. So we must be very sure what the Bible has to tell us. It says, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. What does that tell us about the prophetic interpretation of the book of Revelation? What does it tell us? Doesn't it tell us the things which you have seen? So here is a vision. It was given to him in prophetic vision. Which are? Does that mean there is a then time application applicable to the time in which John lived? Yes or no? Must be because it says which are. And the things which shall be hereafter. Isn't that a prophetic application? Into the future, yes or no? Yes. So we can say that the book of Revelation, particularly this area, this issue, dealing with the seven churches, has a then time eschatological towards the end time application. So we can read it like Matthew 24, which had a then time application pertaining to the destruction of Jerusalem. And it had a future application, eschatological, pertaining to the end of time and the coming of Christ, right or wrong. That's what the book tells us how we should read it. And then it talks about the mystery of the seven stars, which are the messengers, if you like, the pastors of the churches, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, which is the light of the world, the churches of God, because he's writing to the churches. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now the angel in the sense is the messenger, the one sent forth. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So we, we don't need to be in error here. It's very plain what he is talking about. And we must look for a then time application and at the same time see what is the application into the future. Is that fair enough? According to this, now if we go to modern day Constantinople, which is Istanbul, it is a very, very interesting country. This it is a country that is steeped in the Middle Ages, it is like transporting yourself back into time into the 1400s when you visit this country. 
They have some very neat things, like the women work in the fields and the men drink tea. That's very neat. I quite like that. But some of the other things are, are really ancient. And then right next door to it, they have super first, first world. And they have hotels like I've never seen in the world before, relatively cheap as well, and most magnificent food you can imagine, Mediterranean diet, very healthy, lots and lots of things to eat, and uh, great health resorts, and the fun thing about this country is you can wheel and deal and lose everything you ever possessed right there, no problem, but you can also have this dichotomy. You can walk into the past and into the future at the same time. I've never actually been to any other country in the world as varied like this. I, actually, I should become a, a sales promoter for, for Turkey. I'll probably make a buck or two. Anyway, here I am in the Bosporus, and you see the wonderful ziggurats here uh, stretching everywhere. It is a Muslim country, a Muslim country, and of course it has a very interesting past. It had a very, uh, the Byzantine Empire was associated with it, and of course the Turks were very mighty at one time, and uh, they were the protectors of this particular thoroughfare in the Black Sea to the Mediterranean, and they built tremendous castles. Uh, I forget the name of this one, but it was something close like Ngorazi Gati Garipuri, something like that. A really great name, but I've forgotten it. And uh, this is where the sultans protected the seaways of that area. And they have some wonderful traditions to this day. This, for example, is a young lady who is uh, engaged, and then she walks in a beautiful pink dress, and they go in a little horse cart on top of the mountain. And they're dressed very, very smartly. It's a very big occasion. They travel there with their horses. And then when they finally marry, they do the same thing again. And they're dressed all in white. And they're very shy people. And you have very modern Turkish people. And you have very old-fashioned, very steeped in their religion and very conservative Muslims as well. So you're, you're living in this strange world. This over here is the very famous Blue Mosque, one of the largest mosques in the world. Magnificent building if you ever have an opportunity to go there. As you come through the courtyards into this building, it just strikes you about this architecture. And uh, it is a famous place for many, many tourists. This one over here used to be a Byzantine church. This is St. Sophia. It used to be, of course, a Christian church. And it has been taken over by Muslims, and you can see the ziggurats. Inside is very interesting, because when the Byzantine church was there, when it was Christian, it was painted over the, all the walls with Christian reliefs. And when the new religion took over, which is very interesting, by the way, how this Muslim religion virtually wiped out the Byzantine church and destroyed it. And uh, that's very interesting in terms of what we've been speaking about in the past. And today, after they just whitewashed all those walls, through age, the whitewash is crumbling. And inside, when you're walking in this place, you can see the Christian reliefs coming through once again. And I thought that was a rather fitting emblem of this union between the religions. The differences are disappearing. They're not even worrying to wipe it out anymore because they're all coming into one big conglomerate. That's the famous market in Istanbul, very famous for leather. They have very, very good leather goods, cheap leather goods. I gather that uh, the entire police force of the United States gets its leather jackets from here. So I understand. Uh, it's very dark there. Very interesting place. Of course, Turkey is also the place where you can find the famous city of Troy. 
and the story of Helen of Troy and uh, the famous horse. Those are the ruins of Troy. And uh, another interesting town in, in Asia Minor is Troas. That's what's left of Troas today. This is where Paul preached, remember? And he preached until midnight and Eutychus, he, Paul was probably as long-winded as I was and Eutychus couldn't take it anymore. He fell asleep and he fell out the window, remember? And he broke his neck and Paul went and prayed over him. Well, that was right here in this little harbor town when there's still a little jetty over there. Fascinating place. But let us get back to the seven churches, and that's what this lecture is all about tonight. The seven churches, even the name, as I said, had a meaning. So the name sums up the character of the church and what, it, what its meaning is then and in its future application. The character of this church they have then within this letter to each particular church, there is a commendation, except one church has no commendation. Then there is reproof and counsel and promise. And um, there are two of these churches that have no reproof. So in the time, two of them were more or less I presume like God would like them to be. They got no reproof. And one of them has no commendation, which is probably one of the saddest of them all. And it happens to be the last one. Let me take you to Ephesus. Well, those are the ruins of Ephesus. This used to be one of the great centers of learning in the ancient world. And there are many excavations here. The Turks don't actually restore the ruins. All they do is expose them and show more or less how things were constructed. It's actually quite a nice way of doing the archaeology. This over here is this famous street that uh, used to be cobbled with all these intricate designs. So they took a lot of trouble over their cities, and there were lots and lots of statues on the side. Now, the name Ephesus means desirable. It was a desirable condition. And it must refer, being the first one, to the church which existed immediately after the time of Christ. Historically, it had the seat of Diana. And that was, of course, the mother of the gods. And the temple of Diana was built in 480 BC, and it was larger and more imposing even than the other temples of Zeus and others, it was gigantic. And she was the favorite goddess. It is also interesting to note that the Council of Ephesus of the Roman Catholic Church, AD 451, gave the title Mother of God to Mary in this very town in Ephesus. So there are some interesting correlations as we go along there. The mosaics here on this floor are the original mosaics, and you can imagine that Paul walked along that very street. Revelation 2, 1 to 3. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy work and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. So this is the commendation. The Lord says, I'm proud of you. You have good works. You work hard. You are patient. And you make a clear distinction between those that do right and those that do evil. And thou hast tried them which say that they are apostles. How do you try someone? To the law, to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, they have no light in them. So I assume that they studied like the Bereans to see if that which was preached to them was really in accordance with the word of God. So they were still firmly rooted in scripture. So anybody who preached something wrong, 
they could discern it because they knew the word of God. And he goes, found them liars. And has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. That's a pretty good commendation. The first church. The early church was not subject to much persecution compared to later. And the early Christian church grew rather rapidly. In fact, thousands were added to the church daily. Sometimes 3,000 in one day we read in the book of Acts. Of course, if you have lots and lots of people coming in into some new movement, some of them also come in with different motives. Like you can say bread and fish Christians. Some come in because of the excitement. Some come in because of the possibility of getting out of the mess that you are in. And some come in because they really believe what they have heard. And then he continues to say, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So that first fire, what does that first fire do to you? That first fire tells you that you just want to bubble over and tell the next person about what you have experienced. So already then, this church growing so rapidly had the tendency to be a social club. And a lot of the members had lost their first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent. So here is the reproof. And do the first work. Preach. Take it out to the world. Be on fire for the Lord. Or else I will come quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of the place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also Hate. Did you know that God could hate something? God hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now, the Nicolaitans were a sect that followed a certain teacher, Nicholas, who taught, basically, that if you were saved, then you were basically holy, and therefore the law did not apply to you. Basically, it was what Lucifer taught in heaven that the law of God was not an essential component for salvation. And God says he hates that teaching. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 2, 4 to 6. Notice that this early church hated the teachings of the Nicolaitans, right or wrong. We will see that as time progresses, the teachings of the Nicolaitans become not only acceptable, but desirable. Very interesting. So there's a time change as we go along. So this first church has much to commend it. It is a good church. It preaches the gospel. It's lost a bit of its fire. It's tending to become a bit of a social club. And uh, it has, however, strong principles, firmly rooted in the word of God, discernment between what is right and what is wrong, and rejection of false teachings on the basis of the word. So that is something to strive for, and it's something that you and I could do and try and mimic. This is the famous street of Curet in Ephesus. Notice that they had all these statues over here. And if you were a rich person, you could rent one of these statues. And then you could have the sculptor sculpt your head and put it on top there. And if the people walked by, they saw, ah, oh, there's so-and-so, and there's so-and-so. And if, you know, you rented it, and you paid lease money. And if you ran out of money, well, off came the head, and somebody else who had money got his head on top of there. So they were very proud people, and this famous street was known for that. That's the... Temple of Trojan, the emperor Trojan, who was, of course, worshipped as a god, so he had his own temple. You could go and pray to him there. And that's the town hall of what is left of it. And the library, you can see how important books were to them because very intricate architecture, very beautifully fashioned. Temple of Domitian, the temple also of Domitian, some reconstruction, how the, the pillars were constructed, how the stones rested on top of the pillars. 
and this is the famous uh, um, well. And later on, when Christianity took over, they would put their signs there. And so you'll see Byzantine crosses from the early church over there. Then they had various gods who, of course, were very interesting. And if you look at their plumbing, it was superb. It's even immaculate to this day. Those guys still built pipes to last. And this is a very interesting shot. I don't know whether you know what this is. <coughs> That's a toilet. And uh, these were public toilets, and you could sit there and uh, do whatever you do on a public toilet. And underneath, there was a river or a stream which would then remove whatever was deposited in that depository. And it was relatively hygienic. I think they went and processed it, uh, whatever was deposited there in some way. But of course, very public. So it was a very chatty thing to go to the toilet in those days. <laughs> and there is the Scholastica statue in one of the Roman baths. You can see some of the pipes hanging over here. So they had hot water baths and bathing and luxury, very rich, rich people living in this city and very attached to their goddess and Atemia, Artemis, the one with the many breasts, the mother that feeds the world. And uh, it caused the great consternation when Paul preached here, remember? And some of the architects of these statues were very, very upset. And in the end, they wanted to get rid of Paul and they wanted to drag him here to this very amphitheater over here to condemn him to death. Do you remember the story? Well, we know that Paul escaped from Ephesus and went to the next city. And this over here is the causeway leading to this tremendous amphitheater. And that over here was the jetty. And remember I told you that uh, it used to be a harbor city? And the ships used to anchor against this jetty. Of course, there's no ocean whatsoever anywhere to be seen. It is many kilometers away. And the reason being that the little river that you see down there in the valley and this one over here have filled in this area over time. And about 800 AD, it was no longer fit to serve as a harbor. That tells us something about time and that it couldn't have been millions and millions of years that we're talking about here, because just in a few hundred years already this city became uninhabitable. In Ephesus also you have this famous building where the Catholic Church says Mary lived after the death of Jesus, but of course this has been proved to be a fake, but nevertheless it is still regarded as a holy place. So that was Ephesus. The next church referred to is Smyrna. That's a very interesting time, and it's a very short time probably in history, because it refers to a period of great persecution, as we will see. Now, the word Smyrna contains the word mir, which means sweet-smelling. And the sacrifice of Smyrna was a sweet-smelling aroma unto the Lord. It's the one church, or one of the two, that has no rebuke whatsoever. In Smyrna, you had the shrine of the goddess Nemesis. The first minister to this church was Polycarp. He was martyred. And in this time period, from A.D. 303 to 313, you had the terrible, final persecution of the Christians the Diocletian persecution. In fact, this was such a horrendous persecution, the Christians were martyred left, right, and center. And in 313 AD, it was Constantine who ended the persecution and mingled Christianity with paganism. But in a time of persecution, you have only those that are really rooted in the truth that remain. All the rest fall off the bus. So this was no place for a social club. This was serious business. And these people were absolutely rooted in their Bible. 
Revelation 2, 8, 9 says, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things, says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, tribulation, poverty, but thou art rich. What were they rich in? They were rich in the knowledge of the word of God and in an experience with Jesus Christ. They lost everything else, but this experience carried them through. By the way, in Smyrna of the time of John, there was also a persecution. But by the Jews, against those Jews that had become Christians. They were called Jews still at that stage. They were referred to as a sect of the Jews. But there was tremendous persecution within that particular city, even in the time of John. And later, it became the symbol of the great Diocletian persecution. Let's go back. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So here were people that also claimed to have the truth, but who persecuted them and did everything in their power to destroy them of the face of the earth. Fear none of those things which shall, you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. You shall have tribulation ten days. That is the ten-year Diocletian persecution, which ended in 313. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And he that overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Here is the promise of the restoration of and the destruction of death itself. No rebuke. None whatsoever. This church is a model church. And unfortunately it is a fact that the lesson that we learn from it is that persecution is like a cleansing fire. At the end of time, we can also expect a persecution which will change the social club into something else. Well, that's Izmir. That's modern Smyrna. It's one of the big cities in Turkey today. And that's all that's left of ancient Smyrna. Nothing left whatsoever. A little bit of jumbled material here and there. Nothing much left of it. Those are some modern Smyrnans, if you like. These are modern Turkish people. And uh, in contrast, I'll show you some of those of the more old-fashioned, middle-aged or middle-aged people. Not in terms of age, but in terms of the Middle Ages. And of course, in history, what does this refer to? It refers to also the later great time of persecution of, of the Christianity here in the Colosseum, where they were slaughtered by their thousands, where Nero doused them in oil, put tar over them, lit them, and the great suffering. But then comes a very sad period. The period when the persecution ends and Satan tries a new strategy. Instead of trying to wipe this opposition of the face of the earth, every time he wiped one out, ten stood up, he decided to change his strategy, to infiltrate and to work from within. So he married paganism and Christianity. And the sad result is what follows. So the Bible says the next town is Pergamos, which means elevation. Rise like a dough. Something rising like a doe. A.D. 313 to 538 is the most likely historic prophetic time period referred to. Now Pergamos is a very interesting town. It was situated in such a place that it probably couldn't be captured very easily. It was the capital of the Roman province of Asia. It had in it the temple of Zeus, the sun god, the main god of the ancients. There was also Asclepius, who was the serpent god, the one who gives life, the man instructing serpent, the healing serpent, the one that's wrapped around the pole. 
And then the proconsul had a double-edged sword. And this is interesting history. This man has his origin in Babylon. When the Babylonian religion was transferred to Medo-Persia, the Medo-Persians took it over. Then they revolted the priests and they were driven out of Medo-Persia and they founded their city here at Pergamos, or Pergamum. So the Babylonian priesthood was actually situated over there. And they had the whole shooting match, the Palladium Stone, the vestments, the title, Pontifex Maximus, the keys, the mitre, the fish head of Dagon. Everything that you see in Rome today was right there in Pergamos. In fact, the high priest was the high priest of Babylon. And he had the same powers and the same vestments. And then the last pontiff of this city, Pergamum, was Attalus III. And in the year 133 BC, he bequeathed this title to Rome. That meant that the emperor of Rome became the Pontifex Maximus. And he became the reincarnation of the sun god. He was the vicar of the sun god. And he had the mitre. He had the sword, he had the vestments, he had it all. Now you can see how important that sword is in terms of the secret societies as well. And then in AD 378, the Christian emperor Gratian came to power and he refused the title. So the bishop of Rome took the title to himself, never referred to it until the next century. When he said the vestments and the keys and all these things that he had inherited, plus the title, he had actually received from Peter. But in actual fact, it was the same title that belonged to the proconsul of Pergamos and was the original Babylonian priesthood. Well, this is a reconstruction of the temple of the gods, which you will find in the Pergamum Museum. In uh, Berlin, there is more of, of these ancient sites in Berlin, in Germany, than anywhere else. In fact, the one who carried it all away was Kaiser Wilhelm. He was totally besottled with this architecture. And this is the famous depiction of the Battle of the Gods, which is, of course, in a sense, the great controversy. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he which has the sharp sword with the two edges. You see there is a false one with the sharp sword with two edges, who is the proconsul, who is the king of Babylon. And then there is the true one who has the word of God. So you have apostasy and the word of God opposed one to each other. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. So in other words, the seat of the Babylonian religion is called by God Satan's seat. And in Revelation 13, what does he refer to the beast? Who gave him his seat and his power and great authority? The dragon. So later in history, this seat shifted from there when the title was bequeathed to Rome, to Rome. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Now he's talking to God's people. There's a then time application. And there is a story of the apostasy coming in. So you must look at it as a then time, and as a future application. Even in those days when Antipas, there's a lot of conjecture as to who this Antipas was. My faithful martyr who was slain amongst you, so... Some of the early Christians there were slain, where Satan dwelleth, second time. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Wow! Balaam and Balak, do you remember the story? Well... Here was this prophet of God who was to curse Israel. 
And every time he tried, the only thing that came out of his mouth was a blessing. Do you remember that? And three times he tried. Three times Balaam tried and three times he failed. And Balak went totally berserk. And then he said, you know, I have a plan. These Israelites, they don't want to fall because they are clinging to the commandments of God. If we can get them to transgress the commandments of God, then we've got them. Do you remember the story? So that was the plan. And here it says, right here, I have these things against thee because you have them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Well, what Balaam did, he suggested that they bring the dancing girls, remember? And they brought them in, and the Israelites saw that the daughters of men were very desirable, and they transgressed the law of God, and they lost the favor of God, and they could get a hold of them. So, in this case over here, it's the same thing, but we're talking about spiritual fornication. That is mixing with paganism. And worse, eating things sacrificed unto idols. So, during this time period, the whole issue of pagan ritual coming into the church, mingling of truth and error, becomes prominent. And in fact, the mass is the one that rises. And they start eating the same breads that the pagans ate. And Jesus Christ is replaced in the gospel. So here we have this first great mingling step. And even worse, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Did the first church have that? No, they rejected the Nicolaitan doctrine that the law of God can be set aside. But here, this is now favored. So we've had a progression from the original twin pillars, saved by grace, Jesus Christ is the Savior, and obedience to his requirements. Now we're moving away from it. We are mingling paganism and Christianity. Nicolaitan doctrines are acceptable. And uh, the whole issue of Balaam, Balak, is being repeated on a time scale. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So what is the only weapon that you have against apostasy? It's the word of God. That's it. Would it do any good to show signs and wonders and miracles? No, because Satan in the end of time is permitted to counterfeit that. So what we need is a sure basis in the Word of God. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Let him that overcometh, to him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the hidden manna, the true bread of life, the truth instilled in the heart. And I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth, save saying, saving he that receiveth it. This white stone is very interesting. The white stone was the palladium stone, but slaves, when they were released, also got a white stone. And it's interesting that slaves, when they were enslaved, their ears were pierced, and a ring was put in the ear, and the ring represented the sun deity. So they were slaves, even to the sun deity. And when they were released, they received a white stone and the ring was severed. It's interesting that our young people love to put rings in their ears. It's just interesting. Okay. It's also important which ear you put it in, the left one or the right one. That says a lot. Well, that's the modern city of Pergamum. Uh, some great nuts you can buy there. Interesting marketplace. Very fascinating place to be. This is like the Middle Ages. If you want to go and buy your lamb chops, this is where you go. You choose them on the hoof. And uh, these ancient carts and horses and funny little cars 
And this is now much more in the rural area away from the cities. This is the famous Red Hall, which used to be a giant church. That's the outer wall of Pergamum. Shows you how thick it was. The city was almost impregnable, and yet it was taken. And that's the temple of Dionysus. She was a very famous goddess, and so the, the emperors also gave themselves names and masculinized the name. And there's the temple of Trojan and the temple of Zeus. This was one of the, the great wonders of the time period. And the great statues which were in these temples are now nowhere else other than in Rome. There you will find them, and they will have Christian names attached to them. So even to this day, people bow down to these statues. Uh, the one here of Zeus was actually taken away by Kaiser Wilhelm. And eventually the, they got a bit upset with Kaiser Wilhelm and said, you know, you can't take away all our treasures like this. It's not fair. And so he said, all right, I'll give you a gift. And so he built this well for them. So this is in return for all the treasures that he took away to Germany. I thought he paid a cheap price. And it's one of the causeways. It hasn't been excavated in Pergamos. And this is the story of Asclepius. Here is the serpent. And in these temples, the serpent is the one that puts his venom into the water. And that makes the water holy. And when they went in, they put their finger into the water and they made the sign of the cross on them, which was the symbol of Lucifer. This was even before Christianity ever appeared on the scene. And it was called holy water and it had healing properties. So today, in, in Catholicism, you can go to Lourdes and you can get the water, which is holy water, and it has healing properties. It's the same as Asclepius worship. Here is one of these bowls in one of these temples with the serpent putting his venom, his healing venom, into the water. Very strange. The great amphitheater in Pergamum. If you ever go there and you walk down there, the acoustics are unbelievable. You go around the bottom, you can whisper. Everybody can hear you. It is absolutely fantastic. Great wells. And then comes the next time period. And this is a very interesting time period. Tiatira actually means sweet savor of labor, works, or it can mean sacrifice of contrition, or it can also mean Satan's teaching. In fact, I would like to blend the three and say all three of them apply. And the time period we're dealing with is probably A.D. 538 to 1517 when the Reformation started. In fact, this is the church in the middle. This is the middle church. And even Roman Catholic theologians like Holzhauser says it refers to the church of the Middle Ages. It has all the attributes of the church of the Middle Ages, right? Remember in 538 AD, the decree went out that the Bishop of Rome was the corrector of heretics. So Pergamus had seen to the build-up of the unification of, of paganism and Christianity, and then it was baptized into the church, and it received the protection of the state from 538 AD. A.D. onwards. Now in this particular city you had the temple of Apollo, which was the sun god. And in this particular temple there was an altar to a female goddess. So you had the male and the female goddess aspect right in there. The city was also famous for its textile industry. Particularly they used the root of a particular plant and they had purple and crimson dyes and uh, this madder root was used to make these rich dresses and rich colors which were used by the priesthood. So the color purple and crimson are also the colors of the Church of the Middle Ages.
And then the Bible talks about an interesting name. One of the merchants, if you like, a woman, but a woman is also a symbol of the church, is referred to there as Jezebel. Now there's a little rule in Bible, if there is one name and there is a story attached to it, then that is where we can glean some information in the typology. Now Jezebel, in the book of Kings, do you remember? 1 Kings 18.4, 2 Kings 9.22. Jezebel was the queen of the Phoenicians who married Ahab. And you remember that Ahab led the entire Israel into apostasy of paganism and sun worship. And Jezebel is the one who saw to it that the priests of God were murdered. And she had priests of Baal and she had priests of Ashtoreth. Do you remember that? Ashtoreth was the female goddess and Baal was the male god. So here we have the same sort of thing, Temple of Apollo with a male and a female goddess right over there. Jezebel, in the time of Israel, had two sets of priests, one worshipping Baal, one set concentrating on Ashtoreth. And in Catholicism today, we have the same. We have the Knights of the Immaculata, remember, who are Ashtoreth worshippers. And then you have the general run of the mill who would worship either Baal or Ashtoreth. So this interesting story tells us something. Let's read about it. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. So they become more works orientated. But remember it had a then time application. So it's speaking to God's people at that time. But there's also this future application. Notwithstanding I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest thou that woman Jezebel. So this apostasy the sun worship, this replacing of Jesus Christ with another deity is tolerated, which calls herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So God is saying that in this time period, the great apostasy comes to fruition to such an extent that it parallels even that which Ahab did on a larger scale. Remember, who was the prophet that was sent to deal with this? It was Elijah. And Elijah was the one who stood up and said, Choose thee this day who you shall serve. If Baal, then Baal. If God, then God. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. So here is a time aspect. Here God is saying, I give this power, I give this church time to repent. In fact, 1,260 days, 1,260 years is what is involved here. But she repented not. So God is long-suffering. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. This is referring to the 1,260 year tribulation. Except they repent of their deeds. In this time period, there was great tribulation. God saw to it that they got light, but they rejected the light. And so the time period goes on. I will kill her children with death. That's referring to the offspring of this church. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and heart. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, unto the rest in Tiatira, as many as have not this doctrine, this mingling, this sun worship, this female deity aspect, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak. You know, the Bible is pretty straightforward. It says we must study this system to discern where it is wrong in terms of the Bible. We need not be deceived. I will put upon you none other burden but that which I have already hold fast till I come. There is the first reference of the coming of Christ. So when this system starts coming to an end, 
Here is the reference. Hold fast. Christ is coming. And he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. So he's even saying that it's coming to the point where Christ will set up his kingdom. 